feeling satisfaction from the street crowd reaction. Uncontrollable urges submerge in my being completely when my flesh is feeling weak. When I sleep, it creeps into the caverns of my cranium, tries to slip and slide, take a ride through my veins and dig deep. Definition cardiac arrest, but the better of the best wins the quest. Tension and suspicion, nevertheless, I play it cool. Standing in a pool of sweat, I get nervous with temptation. Not the singers, but the thinkers when I'm walking in the wheel, something pushes me. I stumble. Yes, my flesh is weak, but I won't let it get to me. Fall to my knees. And strip it of authority G, golly, wally, willies crawl in my stomach I wanna plunge it from the dungeons and drag it Where's my boy Bragg and the warriors? Fighting, getting smitten by the vice I've been stung by a scorpion But I won't give in to this thing again Temptation flee, cause overtake it I won't be Circumference by the bus full of lust She whispers Indulging the bulging Trappling roots If I give in to the sapling fruits I'm abstaining Cause of my physical training Rain and desire Pain in the fire Is the cost Of wrestling with the lost Say your prayer quick As I watch the heart and trick Being destroyed Her soul mangled in the void Pouring it on thick I got to use my head quick And splurge the thought She tells me that We won't get caught Well, shall I uh, um. Shalom, Israel, and happy Sabbath. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. Uh, thank you for this time, especially to come on your Sabbath, to study your word and to gain knowledge and to gain wisdom and to gain understanding. We thank you and we praise you. We pray, Father God, that you'll be lifted up and that we will not be lifted up, but that our focus will be on you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and that our focus will be on your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this lesson is going to be, it's 30 slides, so it's going to be long, but it needs to be long because we're going to beat a dead horse that needs to be beaten to death. So it's like, it's because it just keeps... It's something that just keeps coming up and it's like messy and we have a lot of confusion and with um, specifically I'm speaking with the the new moon and when the month starts and how you calculate feasts and you got some camps that are like oh it goes off off of the observation we're going off of the observation so they're one day off sometimes and then there were and same thing the camps were also off with that too with debating uh, how are we going to do are we going to do this leap year is it not do we not not leap year leap month do we do the leap month or do we not do the leap month um it's you know and some of them were like you know because maybe that was some type of conspiracy like that and i'm going to touch on that later in the lesson that just sometimes brothers like not everything is a conspiracy of the edomites and the gentiles you sometimes you give them too much credit bro <laughs> like <laughs> Anyways, so, yeah, like, so it was like some of that with the leap month, like, people were doing the leap month, and then they're saying the conjunction is wrong, and you can't use a conjunction because you have to observe, you have to see, you have to see it, they have to see it with their eyes, and it's impossible to do the conjunction because you can't see the conjunction because the conjunction is uh, a complete it's completely dark at, at that time. So how could they be able to see it? And they couldn't calculate it. Um, all of this will be addressed in this lesson. I'm not going to address full moon, new moon people. Cause that's like a whole completely other thing. Uh, like not even other, like it's not even worth. That's just that doctrine is completely unsound. So I'm, I wouldn't even, I'm not going to even address that, but um, also, we're going to deal with the biblical day um, and kind of clear up some stuff with that, too. 
uh, which can which will help you with you know determining when Sabbath is over or not. Once again, you're gonna find that you can determine when Sabbath is over without looking, without having to watch to see when the sun is it completely dark yet. That's not really reliable, but we'll we'll, we'll get into that later. All right, so yeah, it's gonna be a long it's gonna be a long lesson probably. Um, but I did do a lot of research, got a lot of things lined up. We're gonna deal with some history too. Um, yeah. All right. And another thing too, uh, like I've been seeing questions uh, about like cooking um, on trumpets and stuff. And I'm like, you can not cook if you want to, but like on that lesson I did explaining trumpets, atonement and um, tabernacles. I read to you where like you're able to cook from the Bible. And then I read to you where they feasted. And we're going to talk about that again today a little bit too later in the lesson because normally scripture you'll find becomes um, is oftentimes you'll find when you're on a, a certain tangent or a certain time, like certain scriptures will just keep coming up, coming up, coming up. And because they're relevant to what you're discussing or doing during that time. So since right now is like we just had trumpets and it was a new moon and things like that and different issues and stuff that are coming up, the scripture in Nehemiah and Ezra where they celebrated New Moon has been coming up a lot in a lot of my lessons. So um, it, it'll come up in this one, too. And, you know, I'll mention that they went to eat. Uh, all right. So let's start off with the foundation scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verses 32 to 33. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So right there, that's off top. God is not the author of confusion. And I put that this one in here for this for this new moon conjunction, sliver, all this stuff. Uh, lunar Sabbath nonsense. Like so that God is not the author of confusion. So God is not behind this confusion. God is going to be behind whatever is uniform and whatever all people can follow. And I'm going to show you with scriptures and with history. And if you remember, like I used to use a lot, the nickname for this channel, besides first, this is first resurrection of Israelite ministry. It's just a teaching, just a teaching ministry, not a church or anything. I just teach the Bible from my understanding, which from having to do this lesson, like I realized, okay, my understanding has gotten a lot higher than I and I thought it was, it's not, now it's time, I, I don't need to ask as many questions as I used to need to ask. I can probably figure out a lot of stuff using the scripture now for myself. Based off of me having to do this lesson and seeing some other people who are supposed to be like, you know, older. I'm only in my mid-30s and it's like, alright, I'm going to clean this up. Anyways. He's not behind this confusion, okay? He's going to be behind whatever is uniform that all people on the planet Earth can do. And in this lesson, through history and the Bible and science and math, we're going to solve this dilemma and show you how it's not that, it's actually not that complicated, okay? And showing you that the spirits of the prophets are always subject to the prophets. So they, it always needs to be line upon line, precept upon precept. OK, like self-explanatory. The next foundation scripture is Genesis 1 and 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night division. That's a mathematical you know, function. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And we're going to get into what all of that means as this progresses. But it's, this verse is letting you know that the sun, the moon, the stars were all put in the sky for signs, meaning thing. And everybody focuses on signs as meaning I have to be able to see it. A sign can be something letting you know, OK, this is what's going to happen in the future. This is what's going to happen in the future based off of math and geometry. And some geography. OK, and I guess we're going to get into all of this stuff so that we can make this. No longer any spookery, no more ooga booga, so that the normal, regular people in the church can understand the calendar 
and not have any um and this not be an issue okay uh those are what signs are it's in there for signs they're in there for seasons you know we have winter and summer or in the bible there was really two, only two summers winter and summer and we'll get into that later because the assyrians the ancient mesopotamians who were founded by nimrod i always cover that a lot of my lessons too the um uh, their uh the way their seasons work they only had two seasons but the further north you went then they had they, you started getting more seasons based off of the weather depending on and when i say further north amongst those nations okay anyway it's just learning something on your way to learning something but the seasons winter summer fall spring um are determined by the sun and we're going to get into that later in this lesson too so it's showing you this is what the scripture is saying and for days and years. So meaning for a calendar. Okay. All right. Now, Romans 1 and in uh, verses 20 through 21. And this is an important key scripture of the foundation of scripture. Because listen to what it says clearly. Listen to what Paul says. For the invisible things, and this is dealing directly with the conjunction. Like, because you can't see the conjunction. You don't need to see. You don't need to be able to to see it to know when it happens because you can calculate it using a formula. <laughs> That's not like okay. And we're gonna get into two later in the lesson. I don't know why these the you have no problem believing that the ancient like ancient Phoenicians and even um the uh kingdoms in Africa, the Chinese, the and all this could have sailed to America before Columbus, and you got to have that type of capability. But you don't think the ancient people had the the uh, um, the ability to calculate things that we're able to calculate now, like uh, the conjunction of the moon in its phase? I'm gonna show you, like, or they don't know how to do time, then stuff like they, anyways. And I'm gonna bring up scripture references. <laughs> I'm gonna bring up scripture references too. Uh, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So notice here, he's saying the invisible things. Invisible things are things that you can't see. And he's saying, but they are clear since, since the creation of the world, they are clearly seen. So he's saying since the beginning, they have been clearly seen. Being understood by the creation, being understood by the things that are made. What are the things that are made? That's us, humans. So he's saying here the invisible thing since the beginning of time for us, like since the beginning of creation, the invisible things that you can't see have been understand have been understood by the things that are made. So the things he created, humans are one of the things he created. So we have the ability to understand the invisible things that you can't see. There's nothing to un interpret behind that. And like that's why I'm, we're going to show you. I'm just going to take the. I don't know if it's something with the I don't know if it's something with the brothers where it's like you don't want to get into the like science and math and some of this stuff, but it's like it's not actually that complicated. Because uh or let's keep going. Middle of twenty. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So meaning that God has been known since the beginning. And so man is without excuse. Now watch this in verse twenty one too. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. When was an example of that? From the time of Adam until the time of Noah. Before Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was Satan, they partook of that and then that brought sin into the world. Um, Jesus was coming down and, and talking and amongst them. And then even after Adam and Eve ate the um, did that and sin came into the world, Jesus still came down and talked to them. We have that in scripture. Jesus came down and talked to Cain and Abel. Because remember, Jesus talked to Cain like, man, why your sacrifice not? You know what I'm saying? Jesus talked to Noah. Walk, uh, what's your, um, Enoch walked with God. Okay, we have numerous examples. We have numerous examples of this. But what ended up happening? They started mankind started not obeying God, doing their own thing, and then that's how we ended up. We ended up with the flood. Something to consider. You don't think even you don't even think that it's possible that when God was walking down amongst man, he could have gave them the these calculations and formulas. 
Just something to think about. And then it got passed down throughout the, because I'm going to show you, like, even before Abraham, they already had the calendar. Like, the Hebrew calendar is really just a copy of the Assyrian calendar. For all intents and purposes. It's slightly different, but we're going to get, we'll get into that. Okay, so it's like, and that, and the only reason why I bring this stuff up, because like, like I said, my background is in history, academically, and so I like to integrate that into the, like, into the Bible, and show you that with facts, that the Bible um, is factual, okay, and we'll get into that. Why do you think our calendar is like that? Because the Bible tells you Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees, where was Ur? Ur was in summer. Where was summer? Summer was in Mesopotamia with Akkad, Nineveh, that's more up to the north. These are all cities Nimrod founded. Babylon, Ur, all right? And the scriptures tell you, it tells you in the scriptures that the Chaldeans, because people think that the Chaldeans are Ethiopians. No, they're not. <laughs> and it tells you that Nimrod founded Assyria in Genesis, okay? And it tells you in the scriptures that the Chaldeans were not even a people to the Assyrians put them in the land, put them in the land where they were at. So, anyways, just learning something on your way to learning something. Um, Abraham came out of that region. And they already, it's proven fact from history. They have the calendar. They have a calendar from like 2700 BC. All right, and I want to point out another thing too that lines up with scripture. You know, how like the earth, they'll try to say, oh, humans have science or some, you know, this is something that they started saying recently in the last couple hundred years. Before this, they didn't say this. Or right, last like 150 years. Before that, they, they didn't even say stuff like this. But man has been on earth for a million years. Um, I go off of what I can read and I go off of written record and the oldest written record stuff they have goes back to like 2700 BC, 2800. And I'm not talking about like, um, little pictograms put into a rock or something uh, in a like cave, uh, picture thing. And they date the rock somehow. And it's like, Oh, this is older. No, I'm talking about like actual written down in some form of a language. We can only go back to 2700 BC. All right. I'm not, uh, that's all the proof that I have. So, no, the earth, we're still within that 6,000 year time frame as far as humans being on the earth. Now, how old the earth is, the Bible don't tell you that. And so the, the earth could be billions of trillions. Who knows how old it is? All right. Just more learning something on your way to learning something. All right, finishing this out. Neither let's just neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So they rebelled against God. All right, now signs used for plotting coordinates and projecting future celestial events. Seasons are determined by the sun's location in relation to Earth. Day. This is going back to Genesis one and fourteen. Uh, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Once again, um, seasons are determined by the sun's location in relation to Earth. Days are determined also by, lo by the location of the sun in relation to your physical location on Earth. Uh, we're going to get into that. That's called astronomical twilight. And you have astronomical dust and you have astronomical dawn. dawn. And the day starts at astronomical dust with astronomical twilight. OK, and that can be figured out by a formula, too. But anyways, um, years equals God's years equals God's uses the moon. And have Babylon uses the sun. But we have a lunar calendar um, now. Some what we use is a purely in the Western world. We use a purely solar calendar. Um, the calendar in the Bible is a lunar solar calendar. But where the months are determined by the moon. But to make the years, make the year fall in with the seasons, which is determined by the sun, um, that's where the lunar solar part comes in because you have to add in um, a leap year or a leap month. But we're going to get into that, too, because to show you that that's not a conspiracy.
Okay. All right. Okay, continuing on with the objective. The biblical day will be explained using scripture to show that it correlates with astronomical twilight. New moon will be discussed. Problems with the sliver slash observation method and why conjunction method is the best way to keep the biblical feast and new moons. And I have a whole lot of problems with the sliver observation method because it's not logical. And I'm going to show you that with scripture and I'm going to show you that with history. And I'm just going to show you that with common sense observation. That is just not logical. Um, yeah, so I don't know why. That's why it's like it's best not to go off on tangents, man. It's too, people have be coming up with too many conspiracies. Like, well, this dude in 300 and something A.D. Hillel, he came up with this, and this is just something. And so now it's like you know, it's just like when the Pope came up with this, and Constantine did this, and I'm like, yeah, man. Now I know about Constantine and, and other stuff, and people. Sunday and stuff being changed to Sunday from Saturday. I I, I, I know that, but not everything is a conspiracy. They they had leap month before this dude came up with leap, leap month. But we're going to discuss that because once again, the calendar came out of the Assyrians already had the concept of leap month before there was even an Israelite. Like before and before the Israelites existed, they already had that concept. Um. But yeah, anyway, that's gonna get the anyway, anyway, we'll just stop. The sliver thing is gonna get put to bed, hopefully, please. Um the new moon or first day of the month always comes the next day after conjunction. Jerusalem time at even. Even just means evening. Conjunction is easily calculated using a formula. It's just math. Just math. Math and um, you know, like geometry, things like that. The ancient and science. The ancients knew how to do this. Anybody can do it. Once you figure out, and the ancients did know how to do it, and we're going to talk about that later, and I'm going to show you, you can do it. Once you figure out conjunction time at your location, you just add or subtract how many hours your time zone is from Jerusalem to Jerusalem time, which no time zone goes beyond 12 hours of Jerusalem's time zone. The furthest time zone away is like where Hawaii is. They're 12 hours, and that's it. Once you pass Jerusalem, it becomes the next day. And it starts over like at um, a couple hours from Hawaii's time, like and two hours or something. When you start going over to the furthest extremes of like Russia and um, like where Australia and all that. So you just have to look on a map on the other side of the international time, international date line. Where I'm at on the West Coast, we're 10 hours away. So you just add, you just add or subtract that time to determine Jerusalem time. And we use Jerusalem time because, and you're going to hear that through the reason why throughout the rest of this lesson, because it tells you in scriptures that in um, Isaiah that it'll be from one new moon and from um, one new moon to another new moon and from one Sabbath to another Sabbath that they're going to come and worship on those day, uh, worship on those days. Um, and it also tells you, and that's during his thousand year reign. It also tells you that during this thousand years reign that they're going to have to come to Jerusalem for the feast. Okay. Like, so they're going to have to come to Jerusalem for new moon. They're going to have to come to Jerusalem for Sabbath. They're going to have to come to Jerusalem for the feast. And that's where Christ is going to be. So we're going to base it. We're going to base the conjunction time off of Jerusalem's time. So we're looking for Jerusalem's time and you determine the Jerusalem time. Like I said, by subtracting how many ever hours you are from Jerusalem's time zone. OK. The immediate time after conjunction is the waxing crescent when the moon is visible again. Just because it is not visible to someone's naked eye does not mean it is not visible. And I use this example. As soon as conjunction happens, the moon starts moving back over again, where it's no longer completely blocked by the sun. Meaning if you are hiding behind an object that completely covers you, and then you barely stick your pinky finger out, right? Maybe it's just the nail sticking out. Is a part of you still visible? Is a part of you now visible? Are you visible? Yes. Can someone looking at you from the other side of the object tell that you're visible? No. Why? Because they can't see that little part that's just snuck out. Another example, you have an empty glass. And you want to fill it up with water. And that would be like the moon cycle when it gets, when it's full, that's when it's at like full moon. 
when it's empty, that's at the point of conjunction. If you take a little droplet, like a little miniature droplet in, in, in there, and someone looks at the cup, do you think everybody who picks up the cup is going to look and see, oh, there's water in that cup? You understand what I'm saying? Does that mean that there's not water in that cup? No. So we already, you automatically know when conjunction happens that the new moon is there. It's, do we understand that? Okay. Anyway, so let's move on. All right, moving along. We're about to speed this up because, like I said, it's like 30, it's 29 slides. And uh, anybody who knows me personally, like really knows me, knows I'm a fast learner. So we're going to breeze through this. Hopefully you can learn to be a fast learner. If not, that's why this is recorded so that you can pause, take notes, do whatever you need to do. But we're going to breeze through this. All right. Second Peter three and eight, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. I'm just pointing that out there that God's timetable and the one he created for man are different. All right. God is on a whole different, whole nother time. <laughs> He's on a whole nother time continuum. If you want to use that type of language. All right. Genesis chapter one, one through five. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the earth. So in the beginning, it was darkness. We just read that. And the, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay. And now we're not. I got another scripture later. I'm going to read in here. Because people get off on, well, what kind of light was this that was going on? Like, what was it? Uh, what was it? What kind of light was this before there was a sun and a moon? It doesn't tell us. All it tells us is that it was a light and it illuminated. And then later on, when this firmament was firmament was made that blocked the light, that light from coming through, then the sun was created. OK, so we don't have any. Um, like, it doesn't matter. And he tells you that later in Scripture. Where it's, he says, like, I created the light. And basically, like, don't worry about how what kind of light it was. You know, you don't know what he, you know, how he laid out the earth and all of that stuff. Um, you know, anyways. Notes here from that. So notice here though, in verse 5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day, okay? And that light that he called day, because there's some people who be like, no, see, there's two types of days, or there's just, you know, day goes from, it's only when it's daylight. I've had crazy people come with that, because it says day there. That's just talking about daytime, the daytime portion of the 24-hour day, and then you have a nighttime portion of the 24-hour day, okay? To the notes section, we have we have our first full day before the sun was created. No sun means no one knows how long this day was. That's why I was going back like, dude, you don't we don't know how old the earth is. If you were going to calculate it. Nobody knows. All right. Don't get into that. It's not important. Doesn't pertain to salvation. Stop going off on. Stop going off into the matrix and off the deep end with stuff. No sun means no one knows how long this day was. No one knows what type of light this was. The word used in Hebrew is different than sunlight. OK, light equals day like the word used in Hebrew does not is not the same word that's used for. Um, for um, sunlight. OK, so light equals day and darkness equals night. Evening equals the start of the day. OK, and morning equals the end of the day, because then we just read after. He, and he said, and the evening and the morning were the first day. OK, think about this. All right. It's not any spookery. Evening is nighttime. Morning is the day. All right. Um, the Hebrew word for evening here is a reb. And that's um, you can find out in the Strong's Hebrew H 6153. Its biblical usage is sunset, evening, and night, all right? Since no sun was created yet, evening is referring to night here in that, um, 
in this verse. It's referring to night or evening. It's not referring to sunset because there is no sunset, which is darkness. Okay, the day starts when it is completely dark, not sunset. All right, because people be trying to calculate when is it. Oh, I'll just go off of when it says sunset. I mean, you can calculate when it's completely dark. I'm, we're going to get into that. There's a formula for that, too. We're same thing with conjunction. We're going to cover that. Um, the thing is, though, I've seen people where it's like they're trying to look and see, oh, man, is it down? Yet, is it fully down? Which, first of all, you shouldn't be doing because then that means you've made Sabbath a burden instead of a joy because you're waiting for it to be over. But it's not that crazy where we have to be looking for, like, when is it going to be, you know, fully dark? There's a time every day when it's going to be fully dark, you know, unless you live in one of those places where man shouldn't be living. <laughs> but unless you're, like, in the military or up there for science, like Antarctica and some parts of Alaska and stuff, you know, and like I said, we're going to deal with that in this lesson a little later too, all right? So the day starts when it is completely dark, not sunset, and that's the, you can determine that by astronomical twilight. The Hebrew word here for, for Bokar, H1242, its biblical usage is morning and break of day, okay? So that's what it's uh, saying here. The word when it's saying morning, the evening and the morning, the morning meaning the break of day, meaning the start of the day of the um, the daytime portion of the day. So the night and the day were the first day. OK. Self-explanatory. All right. Moving along, moving along. Notes. Since there was no sun yet, morning started with the first appearance of light not sunrise okay so note because there was no sun it, the day couldn't predicate itself on the first day remember the sun's not made till the fourth day okay so when did the daytime start like the day portion of the day it started when there was light okay and we can still do that today here on earth by doing astronomical twilight also notice you have evening equals night equals darkness and morning equals day equals first appearance of light light and both together equal a complete day i'm going to read this again also notice you have evening equals night equals darkness meaning complete darkness and morning equals day equals first appearance of light and both together equal a complete day okay the day associated with morning is referring to light, not a unit of time. Okay, we read that again. The day associated with morning is referring to light, not a unit of time. Okay, so they're not because there's people who say like, no, 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 man. See, that's the day. That's the time of the day. It's just that during the light. That's what I'm like. Oh man, bro. Isaiah 45 and 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and, and create evil. Yes, the Lord can do evil too. Like people don't, I don't understand. That's be the old timers, like old. And when I say old Israelites, I'm talking about just, yo, all our grandmas are like, well, our great grandparents and some of them older folks and back way back in the day. Um, before we started getting all this new age Christianity uh, stuff where God is love and he loves everybody. It was common knowledge. Something happened to you, man. God, what you do to you must have been doing something. God, man. And it's all throughout the scriptures. God doing stuff to people like <laughs> anyways, don't like just learning on your way to learning. I had the Lord do all these things. So the point there with that is he made the light and he made the darkness. You want to know what type of light that was, you know, hopefully you make the first resurrection or maybe you go, you're one of the very, very few that make the cut in the second resurrection <laughs> and you can ask them like, but in the meantime, I, I like to say, have a Coke and a smile, you know, we're all good. All right. Astronomical twilight, dawn and dusk. Astronomical twilight occurs when the sun is between 12 degrees and, they, and buckle up. We're about to get into a lot of like math and science terms and you're just going to read. I'm going to read and you just follow along. Astronomical twilight occurs when the sun is between 12 degrees 
and 18 degrees below the horizon. Astronomical dawn is the time when the geometric center of the sun is at 18 degrees below the horizon. Before this time, the sky is absolutely dark. Astronomical dusk is the instant when the geographical center of the sun is at 18 degrees below the horizon. And let me point something out. Some of the brothers, too, I might just point this out because I remember growing up. Like, oh, yeah, I'm a, I, I was a nerd and stuff, like looking into the books. Don't want to go to school. A lot of brothers don't want to go to school, don't want to take stuff seriously. And it's like, and I always say this on a side note, too. Dude, like, all you have to do, like, with some people who don't, with not graduating high school, it's like, all you have to do is show up. If you show up, nine times out of ten, the teacher is going to pass you, whether you, like, know stuff or not. And, like, when I was in college, even in college, there was courses I took where it was like, how did I pass? I took an astronomy course in college. I don't know this. I don't know a lot of this stuff. You know what I'm talking about? I still ended up, I had to research this again for this lesson. I passed that class with a C. How did I pass it? Because I just showed up. And ended up passing. I had a couple science classes like that, too. So showing up is always, like, half the battle. Um, you can't even compete if you don't show up. But the other thing is, some of this stuff, if you just paid attention in math in high school, like when you're taking geometry, none of this would be spookery or ooga booga like that. It's some type of conspiracy, man. No, it's not. You know, we're plotting degrees here. So, <laughs> like, sorry, but it's just, this is a real frustrating point. This is a real frustrating point because people, you need to keep the feast. It's a commandment. And there's people who take this seriously. And so when your camp is jumping around, you don't have a determined thing, or you're changing stuff, or you're a camp who keeps the same thing, but you don't readily make it available, like how we came up with this, so or, and explaining it to the people, where it's just only certain people know, then we have problems, okay? And that's what we're trying to like rectify here, because there should not be there should not be confusion, and it messes up and it frustrates me because it's like you'll be following someone, and then it's like they change something. I'm like, oh man, so what? So when I was doing it the other way before, I was wrong, and then now we're no what? What? And then what if we're wrong again? And you're just causing confusion. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's just go to the middle. Before this time, the sky is absolutely dark. Astronomical dusk is the instant when the geographical center of the sun is at 18 degrees below the horizon. After this point, the sky is no longer illuminated. In the morning, the sky is completely dark before the onset of astronomical twilight. And in the evening, the sky becomes completely dark at the end of astronomical twilight. Any celestial bodies that can be viewed by the naked eye can be observed in the sky after the end of this phase. Okay. Now, notice here another thing. We acknowledge, we're just proving stuff that the, the people in ancient times knew how to do stuff. Doesn't the Bible, and we're going to read scriptures in common, we, common knowledge, there were astrologers back in ancient times and people who studied the sky. Just like the Mayans had a calendar, the, uh, the, uh, we talked about the Assyrians, the Egyptians, all of them, they all had calendars, a lot of them based off of the moon with 12 months at 360 days, which we're going to talk about later in this lesson. Like, and how did they plot this stuff? By looking at the stars, right? So we right here, we're learning that the best time to be able to see um, different things in the sky with the naked eye is that astronomical twilight. You don't think that the ancients figured out a, a way to determine when astronomical twilight was? Just think, think, learning something on your way to learning something. All right. All right. To use a scene from one of my favorite movies, moving it along here, boss. Just moving it along here, boss. All right. Astronomical twilight. Each twilight phase is defined by the solar elevation angle which is the position of the sun in relation to the horizon. In the horizon, if you remember back from math and school, is just a plane, P-L-A-N-E. During astronomical twilight, the geometric center of the sun's disk is between 12 and 18 degrees below the horizon. To the naked eye, and especially in areas with light pollution, it may be difficult to distinguish between astronomical twilight from nighttime. Most stars and other celestial objects can be seen during this phase. However, astronomers may be unable to observe some of the farther, fainter stars and galaxies as long as the sun is less than 18 degrees below the horizon. 
hence the name of this twilight phase. Astronomical dawn and astronomical dusk. The twilight phases in the morning are often called dawn. Twilight with the twilight phases in the evening, while the twilight phases in the evening are referred to as dusk. However, unlike the term twilight, which describes a time span, the terms dawn and dusk, the, the terms dawn and dusk refer to moments during the transitions between day and night. Astronomical dawn is the moment when the geometric center of the sun is 18 degrees below the horizon in the morning. It is preceded by nighttime. Similarly, astronomical dusk is the instant when the geometric center of the sun is 18 degrees below the horizon in the evening. It marks the beginning of nighttime and the disappearance of the last shimmer of natural daylight. Oh, see? So now we're going to show a couple pictures or examples so you can see how things are plotted, okay, and just get an idea of the concept. So I'm going to leave this picture up for a second, and you can just study it because, like, remember, this is literally like a lesson. We're, te we're going to teach a lesson, just like if we were in school. And part of this is just to show you once again that there's no spookery, there's no ooga booga. It's none of that going on. It's just math and science. Knowledge. Here's another one. And I like this one because you see like where the man is standing, that's the horizon. So it's your it's the person's location, and you have the his horizon. And then it's showing you like that wherever you're at, where your plane, where your plane is, that's how you're determining is going from six degrees, twelve degrees to eighteen degrees, and then you won't have any more daylight. Okay, but this is a good example to look at. Okay, now we're gonna deal with the biblical day ex exception. If you live somewhere like northern Alaska or near either of the Earth's poles, you can go days and or months with no sunlight or darkness. And I have in parentheses here, one should um or in whatever, one should you know the brackets. One should ask oneself, was man made to live there? The reason why I say that is because, um, I mean, yeah, like. <laughs> Like, unless you're doing research or something up there, or like you're with the military, like there's really no reason for man to even really be up there. And another thing to consider, there's scripture in Job where he says, you know, in Revelations, when it talks about that hell that's going to come down and kill man, kill men, and it's going to be so heavy that it instantly just like crushes them. In Job, it tells you that the Lord is gathering all that snow that's on the earth, especially and where is all the snow piled up? And where we have that located, it's in like Antarctica and near the North Pole. And he says all that snow is piled up for when he's going to rain down home to hell on the earth. You know what I'm saying? That's his. That's where it's stock piled up. It's for him. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's the purpose of it. You might not want to be there. <laughs> be up that far up there. You know, just saying. Anyways, needless to say, a mechanism needs to be put into place so that they can observe Sabbath weekly. In um, these instances, instances it should be an S at the end of there. We recommend using the biblical slash Hebrew day clock. So Sabbath would start at 6 p.m. Friday and end 6 p.m. Saturday. Deuteronomy 32 and 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. OK, so he put the bounds of the people to the number of the children of Israel, which is 12, which we're going to get in, which you, you'll see a lot of stuff has been. We've been talking about multiples of 12, 24 hours in a day, two sets of 12. Um, anyways, let's keep going. Here is an example of a biblical Hebrew time chart. Biblical time is set according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, which is 12. A new day begins at sundown, not midnight. The following is a graph showing 12 night evening hours and 12 day morning hours in a 24-hour period. Morning hours are from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
Evening hours are from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, so I'll leave this up for a second so that you can look at it. You can use the chart, because we're moving along now, you can use the chart to the left um, as a reference as we go through these precepts really quick. Matthew 28, 8. So, so when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, can the laborers, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, which is 5 p.m., they received every man a penny. Acts 23, 23. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. The third hour of the night is 9 p.m. And straightway, Mark, this is Mark 15 and 1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest had a constant. Uh, had a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus side. The way the print is or where I'm looking at this on my screen is hard to, the print is low um, or small and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And I don't, this is my thing. I say Pilate. I know people say Pilate, but he was an Italian and I don't know unless I'm wrong. I would think they would pronounce that probably Pilate, not Pilate, but I don't know. Like I said, I could be wrong because when I was in the South, like I grew up in California, but my family is from the South, like a Mississippi and stuff. And I lived in the South for a little while and people would call things like uh, like Lafayette, which is like in French, you would call it Lafayette. But in like Mississippi or Alabama, they call it Lafayette. Uh, you have like Louisville, Kentucky, which is also another French thing. They would call it um, uh, Louisville instead of that. All right, you've got, and I'm just pointing this up out to show differences between language. Any time to do that is an opportunity because we have these people who go off on it. I got to know Hebrew, and it's a conspiracy with the language. There's not a conspiracy, people. <laughs> like, anyways, um, and then like, uh, in growing up in Long Beach in California, like there's a park called El Dorado Park, and if you remember, like the Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre video, um, they filmed it. They were over there at El Dorado Park at one point in the video. But uh, people in the South, they don't call it uh, El Dorado. They call it um, El Dorado. I, I forget how they do it, but they say it a different way. Um, okay, so I don't know. With Pi That was kind of an off tangent, but it's, to me, like with Pilate, Pontius Pilate, I don't know that like it's Italian, Latin. To me, it probably would be Pilate. But um, anyway. All right, and it was the third hour, 9 a.m., and they crucified him. And when the sixth hour, 12 p.m., was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I always point that out. Jesus said that in Aramaic. So if I have, if you have to know Hebrew, why is Jesus crying out to the Father in Aramaic? Shouldn't he be crying out to him in Hebrew? Did him and his disciples even speak Hebrew with each other, or did they speak Aramaic? I don't know, man. Like, anyway, I'm just, mad. I'm just having too much fun. But like, these are things, things to consider, things to consider, people. <laughs>《I read your report from your time spent inside Buffy's brain. Very comprehensive. Well done. Buffy, I understand you think I smell weird, but I believe it was my body wash, which I've changed, so now you should love me. <coughs> now where will you sleep, you ice queen? You think you're better than me? You're not better than me. You're going to learn a hard, hard lesson. Now you're going to learn a hard, hard lesson. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right. Now, like, I'm like, we're down to this conjunction and the observation and sliver thing. This is like getting on my last nerve. Uh, 
and we're going to deal with this rationally. We're going to deal with this logically. We're going to deal with this with math and science. And we're going to deal with this with the Bible. We're going to deal with this with history. So hopefully we beat this thing till it's done and it doesn't come up anymore. All right. But first, let me deal with my problems with the observation or sliver. If you have to only observe the moon and you have to observe the new moon when you can see it in the sky and somebody has to observe the little sliver, what happens when it's cloudy? And when and then they have things where they'll be like, well, then you just assume, well, you know, the next day when they see it, then that'll be the day and they make a correction or they do, you know, well, see uh, what they have to do with this. And that, mind you, like none of this they can read to you in the Bible. They can't read to you where anybody did any of the stuff that they're talking about. Uh, which I'm going to come to that point in a second, but whatever. That right there is just like, okay, man, that, that's causing confusion. And it's left up to someone's interpretation. What if somebody else, what if in one part of the world they see it and in another part of the world they don't see it? You feel me? And there's no way to calculate that so that it can be in uniform time. That's why when I first started hearing some of the camps go away from conjunction and doing it, that's why it irked me in the initial part, because I was like, in my spirit, it didn't sit well, because I'm like, this is going towards confusion. And I'm like, God is not the author of confusion. And God's not going to give us anything where we can't figure out a way to, to keep it. That would not be that stupid. That doesn't make any sense. And there's too many problems when you have to deal with human observation that they you can't account for. Okay. Like with the form, I've been showing you everything I'm showing you is things that you can figure out that can be figured out yourself. Okay, and I'm gonna show you, and I, I'm gonna show you with conjunction how you can figure that out with um with um a formula. Okay, and I'm gonna actually give you the formula with astronomical twilight. We discussed some things about the degrees and the horizons and all that stuff. There's a way to figure that out too with math. You know what I'm saying? You can go look that up on your own if you're interested in that. But with the conjunction one, I'll actually give you the formula because with this one, I want to beat this. I want to beat this one in. OK, that's why I had to clip from American Dad where I'm, where Bullock was like, you're going to learn a hard, hard lesson. OK. All right. So if it's cloudy, that makes a problem. And what if and then that being the case, what is if it's observed in different parts of the world at different times because of weather? OK, what if one person says he saw it at this time and another person didn't say he saw it? OK, that like confusion. That doesn't make sense. Cannot read one example in the Bible. There's not. I have yet to read one example in the Bible where it says. Da 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 person was outside looking up at the sky and he observed that the moon, the sliver was in the sky and, and he saw the moon in the sky and he blew the trumpet or the shofar and told, or he, and told the people that this is new moon. Now it's time to start them. Now it is time to start the month because that's what they that's what the observation people go off of because they're going tradition from the Talmud and which also has crept into other history books. And there's some and historians because I think even Josephus talks about it. And I use Josephus a lot um, for referencing things and doing things with history, too. Um, point is, though, is that what they go off of is saying. See, that's how, the, that's how the ancient Israelites used to have to do it. They have to observe it. And then they would let people know they would do the horn and put like a smoke signal and then let and, you know, and let people know that that was a new moon. Um, and which I'm going to get to why that's logistically doesn't is not possible. But in, the, in a minute, but um, there's nowhere in scripture where they can read that they did that. So, yeah, and then when you pull up all of these, when they pull up all of these resources to, to say that, I'm like, just read that, though, one time to me into the Bible. You go into a thousand books, but you're not reading it to me one time in the Bible because all of those books you're going to are referencing and, are, and even like some of the Bible commentaries and stuff are basing it off of the idea that they had to observe it. OK, like they have to observe the sliver in the sky, which we don't read anywhere in the scriptures where that's true. I'm going to show you later in this scriptures where it we have more scriptures that indicate that they knew when the new moon was coming already meaning that they didn't have to do that they didn't which in it uh based off of the conjunction which meaning they didn't have to wait to see a sliver in the sky there's more scriptures in the in the bible that indicate that as a possibility than there is for the sliver because with the sliver thing there's none 
Okay. All right. Um, confusion. I've already showed you why I'm not. We've already talked about that. The next one, logistically impossible. All right. You're supposed to go up to the uh, to Jerusalem for the feast, right? So including Feast of Trumpets, even the people were like, oh, well, you, you know, that's not a feast. Whatever. So I got that for an example. If that's not a feast or if someone who's to say, well, they don't have to go up to Jerusalem for Feast of Trumpets. Because I'm using Memorial Blowing of the Trumpets as an example because that that happens on New Moon, right? How is that? If you look in Ezra and Nehemiah, using that as an example, that's the one, too, where it's in uh, the end of Nehemiah chapter 7 and then it goes and then starting with chapter 8. They um, and that's where they they ate. They went and had food and feasted. And it was they were told to have a joyous time on the trumpets. OK, I don't know why, like, you know, some people are like, nah, you can't do that. But um, OK, you know, I mean, maybe I mean, I'm guessing it's because it's Ezra and Nehemiah. And they're like, I didn't read that specifically in Leviticus or something. Um, but Anyways, when they came to Jerusalem, they had to come to Jerusalem, excuse me, and it says there that they came from their cities. How would it be possible? Do you know how far it takes to travel? Like think, and I haven't, I'm going to have an example on the next page, next slide, but imagine someone in an ideal situation. Imagine someone back in Old Testament times, someone coming from Northern Israel who needs to get to Jerusalem. And you're some like 80 miles away from Jerusalem. So you mean to tell me that someone in Jerusalem had to witness the sliver in the sky and then do -do -do, blow the trumpet and announce that it's now new moon. And now we're having Feast of Trumpets. And then they they set off fire smoke signals to go all that way to let everybody in Israel know. Right. And then you have to assemble yourself into into Jerusalem. Right. Tell me how the person in the town of Israel, like that was like in northern Israel that are 80 miles away, how they going to get to Jerusalem uh, within that same day in order to partake of this feast? You can't go 80 miles in one day with that. They didn't have cars. They had to walk it or else they took it on horseback. And even when they went on horseback, if you're going as a family, you're not speeding through. The horse is just really carrying you as y'all are walking. It's still at a walking pace. You're just not doing the walk. OK, so that would be think about this. There's nothing you can say that refutes what I'm saying about this right here. That's not physically possible. So that doesn't seem logical. And we read and you can read in Nehemiah where it says and all of the Israelites came from their cities and they assembled as one man in Jerusalem on the first day of the month, which was trumpets. So if they're observing the sliver how that's not possible they would have had to have known in advance in order to assemble to uh assemble themselves in jerusalem okay point two here ancient civilizations were not dumb and this is just one example from the bible the ancient israelites had clocks isaiah 38 8 behold i will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of ahaz 10 degrees backward so the sun re returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. So right, I'm just using that verse and we'll maybe discuss a little bit about what just happened with this later in this lesson with the him doing the sun thing going back. Um, but the sundial was a clock. So they had a way to tell time. Um, yes, like, OK, it's not a conspiracy. And just to throw this out there, the Dogon people in Mali with them finding that whatever star, I don't know if it was serious or something or they were able to see things that are not possible to be seen with the naked eye and they had already plotted it and they just live in like mud huts in Mali and they you know what I'm saying like come on just throwing that one out there think about it look into the Dogon people of Mali and like the, their uh, um, astronomical capabilities okay this is a screenshot from Google Maps but I did the distance from Beersheba to Jerusalem, which you can look up on, you know, just do Google directions. And that's why when like when when people say that the Bible, oh, you know, you meet a comedic person or an atheist or whatever, and they're like, oh yeah, the Bible, man, none of that stuff's true. You can't prove none of that stuff happened. Like 
I don't even get into that with people because I'm like, dude, you can just look around the planet Earth and it's all around you, dumb dumb. Because it's like, dude, like, why is the city, the city is still called the same thing as called in the Bible, Beersheba. And some of these cities, like, these names haven't changed. Like, it's not like something that just, that's the name now because the, the Edomite Jews came back over there and, and renamed it that. No, like, it's been called that from time immemorial. You know what I'm saying? Like, when the Arabs have it, they just put, pronounce it in their Arab way of saying it. It's the same name. It's the same stuff, bruh. Like, anyways, so you have here where driving distance is something like 75 miles. And then I have the I have it plotted with a direct route from Beersheba to Jerusalem. And it has, um, that is like 40 something miles. Cause I can't, it's on my screen, it's super small. But anyways, you got to imagine they're not going to just go through the wilderness. They would have had roads or paths trodden out. So it probably wanted to, even in, um, in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, it probably wouldn't have been a direct shot like that. They would have to have taken some type of road or path. But the point is, is there's no, and remind you, Jerusalem is in Judah's allotment and Beersheba is in Judah's allotment. And I'm not even just talking about the kingdom of Judah. I'm talking about their allotment of land. Beersheba is in Judah's allotment and Jerusalem is in Judah's allotment. So at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, how did someone in the city of Beersheba get to Jerusalem in time to keep trumpets if they have to wait for someone in Jerusalem to observe it and then send the word over to them. You feel me? Or even think, even if they observed it in Beersheba themselves that night, how did they make it to Jerusalem? When if you see here, you're taking a road and now in modern times, it's 70 something miles and a direct path there is 40 something miles. Let's split the difference. And say maybe they took like 50, 55 miles, whatever path they took. You can't do that in one in the same day. That's going to take you at least two and a half days. And that's pushing it. That right there should bury this, you know, sliver observation thing. But as you're looking around, um, I just want to point some stuff out. As you got this map up, learning on your way to learning. You have Gaza there. You find Gaza in the Bible, mentioned all throughout the Bible. You have Ashkelon as a city, Ashdod. Those are all mentioned in the Bible. Those were cities of the Philistines. You have Tel Aviv, you have, you know, Gaza or the Philistines. You have Tel Aviv, which is Tel Aviv, like the month of Abib. That's really what it is. Just wanted to point that out. And then if you look over to the right, you have Amman. And what is Amman named at? That's the capital of Jordan. And it's named after Ammon, which is in the Bible. And that's the capital of Jordan. So the capital of a country is named after Abraham's um, grand nephew. Because Ammon came from Lot, which was Abraham's nephew. So Abraham's grand nephew is the name of the capital of the nation of Jordan. And you have people walking around saying, oh, the Bible, there's no way you can prove the Bible. That, that history is wrong. It's not backed up by anything. Dude, the, the capital of a nation today is named after Abraham's grand nephew. Come on, bro. Like, these are just like, like, really, dude? Really, really? All right. All right, moving along. New moon conjunction. Months in the Israelite calendar are based on the phases of the moon. A new month begins on the day of the crescent moon after the new moon phase. Because the sum of 12 lunar months is about 11 days shorter than the solar year, a 13th month is periodically added to keep the calendar in step with the astronomical seasons. Okay, and that's where some of these people get off into the conspiracy stuff. Just like with the, I still hear brothers saying uh, Scipio Africanus, that's the you named after a white man, you named after an Italian. I've, I've said this like, so many times on here. And I just heard this recently. No, no, no. There was a people in Africa already called that were in Northwest Africa and they were called the Afri people. F-A-R-I. In some transliterations, it was F-R-I. And then in others, like that's like Roman or something. And then in the Greek or something, it was like A-F-E-R. And then Josephus even said, that's what they called them already. Then Josephus, uh, and that's what they call it themselves. They have their own, their name. This is what the stuff is based off of. And then Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that 
Um, that comes from Ephra because they come from Abraham's grandson via Midian, who Josephus says Abraham helped to place over there when he was given his children from Keturah um, land allotments or the children from his concubines land allotments. He helped place them there. They supplanted the original Libyans, which were Ham's son put. That's what Josephus says, just putting this stuff out there. And that's where the root comes from, Ephra, Afar, Afri. That's what he says. But either way, the point is those people were already living there. The dude you call Scipio Africanus already had a name. And he had an Italian, like a surname, a Roman surname from his family. He was given the name Africanus after he defeated those people. And when I say given, he wasn't like he changed his name. That was a royal title given to him because he had, after battling in Carthage, in the area where those people were, they gave him that title. You feel me? It's just like if somebody right now in, if somebody from the Vietnam War, war uh, you know, was, did good in battle in, you know, Bangkok, and his name was, you know, or somewhere in Cambodia, and his name, and then they called him, you know, General uh, Tom Sumter Cambodia. You know what I'm saying? Because like they just gave him that title because that's what he had conquered the area. OK, they, it wasn't named. That wasn't his name. It wasn't. So we're you're not African doesn't mean I'm named after Scipio Africana. Look that up. OK, that's another one of those uh, fables, you know, them Jewish fables and traditions to talk about in the New Testament that we have Negro fables and traditions that have crept in and they haven't been corrected. Um, so same thing here with this. They'll say that this is a the dude who came up with this in 300, the guy who came up with the the way we're using it now for the leap year in the 300s, that somehow that was a conspiracy and he's changing something, blah, blah, blah. Dude, they, they had, we're going to cover this, but they had leap year, they had leap month and leap year before that guy, before that guy even existed, they their leap month was already. They've been doing leap month since like the third millennium BC. Anyways, a leap month occurs seven times in the nineteen year metatonic metonic cycle, with three, six, eight, eleven, fourteen, seventeen, and nineteen of the cycle being leap years. This corresponds to a frequency of every two to three years. The met, the metonic cycle, also known as, I'm not going to even try to read that, is, I mean, try to pronounce that, is a period that comes very close to being a common multiple of the solar year and the lunar month, a synodic month, with a deviation of just a few hours. 19 solar years have very nearly the same length as 235 lunar months both periods amounting to 6,940 days. This makes it possible for Israelite time reckoning to approximately stay in sync with the solar year simply by adding a certain amount of full months per metonic cycle. Since 19 years with 12 months accumulates to 228 months, seven extra months must be added to arrive at a total of 235 months per cycle. I'm going to keep moving on, but as you see, it's just math. Okay, some things to consider. I have Joshua and Hezekiah here and just to and 365 slash 29.5, just because a new moon cycle takes about 29.5 days for the conjunction to complete itself. And most ancient calendars had just 30 days at 360 days. And then you can read in the Bible when it talks about certain prophecies like being three and a half years and other, it, you know, it's based off of 30 days continuously for 12 month cycles. And 30, and then there's other incidences in the Bible where you can read where it's like, man, and it seems like it's 30 days. Um, which mathematically, the, just pointing something out, mathematically 29.5, you would round up at 29.5 and that would, you know, make 30, but it's still not precise, uh, on the 30. And so it, that's another one of those things where people be straining out a gnat because I just be like, where you read that at, like with a 1260 or whatever it is, it's like, dude, all we need to know is it's three and a half years and it's going to be, and that's how many days it says it's going to be. Like, 
for that for that. So that means that three and a half years is gonna be that amount of time. Ain't nothing else for me to figure out about that. <laughs> like anyways, but I was gonna say that maybe uh, something to just to consider, like this for you or your own to consider. When Joshua made the sun um and the moon stand still so the earth didn't move anymore, the rotation stopped and it wasn't for a whole day, but it was for about a whole day. And then remembering with Hezekiah, they made that where we read in Isaiah where the sundial went back. Um, the sundial went back for him and that uh, meaning he made the sun go back. And then according to what they give you, the, the degrees that they gave in that chapter, we can tell that's about 40 minutes. So about 40 minutes of time was lost in conjunction with Joshua almost having a whole day lost. So maybe that threw off why it can't match up with uh, the lunar, can't match up completely with the solar thing, with the seasons. I don't know. Maybe because there was no sun and moon for the first four days. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. We, you know, maybe we'll find out or may, maybe we'll figure it out at some point. Or if not, we can just ask Jesus when we meet him. Things to ponder. Also, the leap year is not a conspiracy. The citizens of... Summer, an ancient civilization that existed in modern-day Iraq, also used a calendar that included 12 months. And summer is just Mesopotamia, ancient Assyria. Remember, Assyria had different um, titles for their empires. There's like the Neo-Assyrian, you know, the pre. There's different parts, just like with Egypt and stuff, too. And so at different times, they used different names, like summer, Akkadia, um the um, Akkadian Empire, stuff like that, okay? The Sumerian citizens tracked 354 days each year. Occasionally, they added an additional month to the calendar to account for the remaining 11.25 days in a year. This is an example of an early leap month slash year. Unlike other calendars, the Sumerian calendar did not have a uniform or consistent naming system for the included months. The Hebrews came out of Samaria, also most other ancient civilizations. And when I say the Hebrews came out of Samaria, because Ur is list is was one of the cities of Summer. Okay, if you look up, just Google Sumeria or Summer, the Empire of Summer, and you'll find that Ur was a part of that because Summer, Ur, Akkad, Nineveh, Babylon, they're all a part of Mesopotamia, which was founded by Nimrod. Anyway, so Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees. This is the calendar that they were already using but when Abraham left out. So this is the, and it's similar to the Hebrew calendar. It's pretty much the same calendar. It's a lunar calendar. All right. Like, and we came out of that area. You have to remember, you guys always think that everything with the Israelites just start brand new. It's not going to start brand new. They already had a calendar like this when they left Assyria or, the, you know, land Mesopotamia, land of the Ur of the Chaldees. When they get to, um, then when they get the, you know, by the time Moses and stuff is working this stuff out with them too, we're getting more instruction from God now on how to keep stuff and do stuff. But for all intents and purposes, before the will, before Moses dictated the stuff about the feast, the Israelites would have already been using a lunar calendar. Abraham would have been using a lunar calendar. Jacob would have been using a lunar calendar. Abraham's uh, ancestors, Terah and all of them, would have been using a lunar calendar because they were in Assyria, and Assyria already had a lunar calendar in place. Okay? And then the Hebrew calendar is very similar to the um, Assyrian calendar, just like the Hebrew language is very similar to the Canaanite language. All right? Um, also, most other ancient civilizations had 360 day calendars that with 30 days and either a leap year slash month later added one or like the Egyptians had five days at the end of the year that did not belong to any month. In the precept slide following, soon we will explain why a biblical month cannot simply be counting 30 days. I'll show how that's not. We'll show like that's not possible. In case someone just started thinking, well, why? How come we just can't count thirty days? No, you you, you can't do that because that'll uh, muck stuff up. It'll mess stuff up bad. 
Okay, the information um, that I've been giving you so far has come from different sources, different like astronomical sources um, about those subjects that I've kind of just tweaked some to put into my own words a little bit. And when I say tweak, it's pretty much the same thing they said, but I just put stuff into a little bit more simpler terms for people to understand. Um, what we're about to read right now, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. They didn't say Northeast Africa. They said middle, you know, the Middle East and Near East. But, you know, we know that the Middle East, there's no such thing really as the Middle East. That's just Northeast Africa. Um, so I adjusted that when I put it, when I put the information into the slide. The Northeast African, and I have in, the, in parentheses, Near East, which is the Middle East, lunar calendar. In which months are lunar, but years are solar? that is, are brought into line with the course of the sun, was used in early civilizations of the whole Middle East, except Egypt and in Greece. The formula was formulated, invented in Mesopotamia in the third millennium BC. Study of cuneiform tablets found in this region facilitates tracing the development of time reckoning back to the 20th century, 27th century BC. Near the invention of writing. Remember I was telling you that's when we have writing. So I don't go, I don't, anything you're telling me is that, that's beyond that, too far beyond that. I can't roll with that, bro. That's what I go, that's what I go with. Okay. So I roll with the Bible. Bible tells us man only going to be on here 6,000 years. And we can calculate time, we can calculate the time from Adam. You know what I'm saying? Like to, to now. Like, no, like how, so how many years man's been on earth? Um, nah, like it ain't, man has not been on earth hundreds of thousands, millions of years. No. And we didn't evolve from monkeys and whatever into Australopithecus and Homo erectus and all Neanderthal and all of that nonsense. Um, the evidence shows that the calendar is, the calendar is a contrivance for dividing the flow of time into units that suits society's current needs. Though calendar makers put to use time signs offered by nature, the moon's phases, for example, they rearrange reality to make it fit society's constructions. In Mesopotamia, the solar year was divided into two seasons. The summer, which included the barley harvest in the second half of May or in the beginning of June, and the winter, which roughly corresponds to today's fall or winter. Okay, um, so you see here that even even before even before the Israelites had anything saying like that it was there's only two seasons this you know summer and winter are hot and cold. You see here in the Bible, I mean not in the Bible, you see here in history that the Assyrians also believed that concept, and they believed that concept before the Hebrews even left out of. Um, out of Assyria or out of Mesopotamia. So, yeah. Anyways, um, also too with this barley harvest, because people get on. Well, I, you also have to observe. I have to observe when a bit because it says observe, you know. And so when I see the grain, blah blah blah. Man, all that saying is it, in the season, which is springtime, when that comes. That's when you need, that's what you're, you have to keep it in that time. You don't got to watch for the single little, I got to watch and see when the grain, because once again, it's like same thing, read to me. Anyways, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to go into that. We're going to beat the horse dead, but we're not, I'm not going to beat it that far. All right. All right, man, I told you it was going to be a lot of information. That's why I was just like. I've been holding off on doing this lesson because I was like, I'm going to see if some of the elders like figure this out or put something out. And the ones that are off, if they're going to correct themselves. But I'm just like, OK, like and then the ones who are correct, like, are we going to put something out so that we, you know, have something documented or at least maybe you already do. But can we make that available to the people? All right. So it's been a lot of math and a lot of science and a lot of history, but it's going to continue to be that way. And, you know, with the Bible, too, but we're about to pick up some more scriptures going into the end.
In modern astronomy, the new moon is when the sun and moon are aligned, with the sun and earth on opposite sides of the moon. There are several reasons why it is impossible for us to see the new moon in the sky. And when they're saying new moon now, they're talking about the conjunction. The alignment of the sun, the moon, and earth leaves the side of the moon that faces earth in complete darkness. Technically, this is called a conjunction or syzygy in the sun, earth, moon system. See illustration. I don't have the illustration because where I, I'm not putting it from here, but where I took it from, they had an illustration. In addition, the new moon rises and sets around the same time as the sun. Bring it, bringing it too close to the sun's glare to be seen with the naked eye. This intermediate moon phase comes after new moon and lasts until half of the moon's surface is illuminated at first quarter moon. In modern astronomy, the waxing crescent moon starts as the moon becomes visible again after the new moon conjunction, when the sun and earth were on opposite sides of the moon, making it possible to see the moon from earth. And that's what I was saying earlier with the example I give. The new moon is visible immediately at the waxing crescent. So as soon as um, the conjunction is over, the moon is visible. It's just such a small portion of it that you can't see it with the naked eye. And you're not going to be able to see it with the naked eye probably to the next day or two afterwards. And, you got, and you're looking at it at, sun, at sunset at a time when you can see the sliver clearly. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that the moon wasn't visible before that. I use that example of if you're completely covered by an object and you have somebody else who's facing, who's standing 10 feet away facing that object, but you're completely covered by that object. They can't see you. You're not visible. If you stick out your pinky finger and only your, only the nail from your pinky finger is peeking out somewhere on that, um, out of that object. And that person is standing 10 feet away. Are they going to see your nail pinky? I like the nail from your pinky and be able to see that you're visible. No, but are you visible? Is part of you visible? Yes. Okay. Like that's what we're all right. Like that's why you go with the conjunction, which you can calculate. And then the next day, at evening is when you start the next day and you base it off of Jerusalem time. That's not, you get what I'm saying? Like, that's not that, that's not that complicated. That's why this year with the people who do observation sliver and the people who do conjunction, that's why they fell together on the same day. For whatever, because people were wondering, some people with that were like, oh, why, what's going on? Or whatever, because it was Jerusalem time was at nine. And I covered, um, anyways, I'm digressing. Let's just keep going on with the lesson. Let's just keep going on with the lesson. All right. Where were we? The intermediate moon, the intermediate moon phase comes after new moon and lasts until the half, to, until half of the moon surface is illuminated at first quarter moon. In modern astronomy, the waxing crescent moon starts as the moon becomes visible again after the new moon conjunction. When the sun and earth were on opposite sides of the moon, making it impossible to see the moon from earth. Waxing means that it is growing, while crescent refers to the curved shape similar to a banana or a boat. With some variations, the waxing crescent moon rises in the daytime before noon and becomes visible in the day sky. It gets more visible around sunset, but normally sets before midnight. All right, point three here. A lexicographical tablet from the library of the Assyrian king Ashur Banipan gives the names attached to several days of the Babylonian month, and among these is a designation Shabbatam, applied to the 15th day of the lunar month. Still more recently, a similar use of Shabbatam has been found in texts which contains an account of the course of the moon during the lunar month. References here made to the first appearance of the new moon, crescent, its ash gray light until about the seventh day thereafter, its opposition with the sun on the 14th day, its aspects on the 21st day and 28th days, and finally its disappearance on the 29th and 30th days, being the time of conjunction with the sun. In this description, which for minuteness recalls the Polynesian naming of of the nights from success from successive aspects of the moon. 
15th day, and the 15th day again appears as Shabbatham. So anyways, Aaron, you see even with the Polynesians using their thing, looking at the night sky, Native Americans have done this. But the point is, is this is showing you that they had already documented and the Assyrians are already had already documented how to figure out conjunction. Being it was documented here in this in this lexicographical tablet, being the time of conjunction, they were able to calculate that. That was something that they were able to calculate. Okay, a sidebar. Because there's some people who go with a lunar Sabbath Sabbath. That really comes out of Babylon, because you're reading the ancient in ancient Mesopotamia, the Assyrians, um, at one point they had set up where you didn't work every seventh day. But it wasn't every seventh day of the week. It was every seventh. It was every seventh day from the lunar moon from the first day of the month. OK, so they base it off of the lunar thing. So when you're doing that lunar Sabbath where you're sat or some people call it floating Sabbath, that really comes out of Assyria. And that's not based off of the Bible. We do it on the seventh day of the week because follow me here when I explain this. I've said this before lots of times, but the sun and the moon were not made till the fourth day okay so you can't go there was no lunar thing to figure out the sabbath because the sabbath was instituted on the seventh day of creation so there was already four days in that week that took place before there was a sun or a moon and you're basing it off of the moon right there was already four days that took place and then on the seventh day he had the sabbath that's letting you which is the the, the time of rest okay all right you feel me like, so how we don't know and there's no biblical precedent to go off of a floating lunar Sabbath. OK, the first Sabbath instituted by God on the seventh day of creation happened on the seventh day when the moon hadn't been created till the fourth day. If you're doing a lunar Sabbath, then God should have made the earth should have had the moon created on the first day. Right. Just learning something on your way to learning something. All right, now we're going to get into the math. Because like I said, people make the assumption, the ancients, you can't calculate conjunction. Like, they couldn't calculate that. This is all, this is all spookery. He just came up, the Hillel in the, in the fourth century just came up with a concoction that we don't know. It's a secret formula. No, like, uh, okay, buddy. All right, calculating conjunction. Now, buckle up. This is we're in class now. We're going to do some math. All right. Be, being that the movements and phases of the moon are very precise and dependable, it makes them function just like a giant clock in the sky. We can observe the moon, and I'm making, I'm stressing these points because I've not seen these cats. Come out trying to, you know, I got to observe another stuff. And what about the leap uh, month? I can't read that in the Bible. Ah, and, they, and they come with thousands of books. All right, that's why I'm stressing these points. I just want to, like, stressing things to just show you how simple this stuff is. The the star, the moon and the star. Didn't we read in the beginning in, with, in the foundation scripture with Genesis 1 and 14 that these were put in the sky for signs, seasons, days? And for time and stuff, man, and years, that's what this is saying. That's what I'm telling you here. It's just like a giant clock in the sky. We can observe the moon's phases as they wane from the last quarter phase to the ever-shrinking crescents and measure the decreasing distances between them and the rising sun in the east. Sometime after um, the third Sabbath of your month, you, that's normally when you're going to find this phase in the moon. Um, you may calculate the conjunction by making several observations or measurement sightings and math while holding. And now I'm going to give you an example of how you can simply do this from at home while holding a measuring tape or ruler that is graded in centimeters. And yes, the ancients had rulers and measurements. They, that's how they met. They were able to measure stuff. Uh, while holding a measuring tape or ruler that is graded in centimeters and held at arm's length, measure the angular separation between the sun on the horizon and the waning crescent moon. Take several readings and record them. Just be sure to measure from the center of the sun to the center of the moon. And don't worry, I'm going to have a picture showing you this on the next slide, what this looks like. Okay, so it's not complicated because I know a lot of people when it comes to math, they start getting 
scared. Like, oh, this is, you know. All right, we're just going to work through this. I'm not, anyways, we're just going to work through this. The next step is relatively simple. Here is a brief explanation of the formula. It takes the sun 24 hours to make one complete circle, that's 360 degrees, over the Earth. This equates to 15 degrees per hour, which is 360 degrees by 24 equals 15 degrees. The moon, however, takes approximately 24 hours and 50 minutes to make a complete uh, circle. This equates to 14.5 per hour, and I have in parentheses 360 degrees by 24.88 by 24.83 infinite equals 14.5. Note: 24.83 infinite is 24 hours, 50 minutes in decimal form. This means that the moon loses this moon. This means that the moon loses half a degree on the sun every hour. Said another way, the sun gains half a degree on the moon every hour. Consequently, the moon loses approximately 12 degrees every day, a degree by 5, 0.5 degree times 24 hours. Once again, you have the boundaries of Israel there. Remember, and from Deuteronomy, it will be set up, the, the boundaries of the people were set up by the nation of Israel, and that's 12. There we have that again. So it's not spookery. It's not ooga booga. It's not a conspiracy. It's just math, and the math lines up, and it's a formula, and it lines up with the Bible and the 12, the way stuff works, okay? This is why a lunar month, the period from one conjunction to next, is about 29.5 days. On average, 360 degrees by 12 per day equals approximately 30 days to complete one cycle. Bear in mind, we are rounding numbers here. Like I was telling you earlier, 29.5, you would round up to 30. Okay. All right. Don't worry. The picture is coming on the next slide. That show, just show you how simple this is now, but we're still continuing with the math. Measurements. Take the average reading and divide that number by 0 0.5, the number of degrees the sun gains on the moon each hour. The resultant number reveals how many hours from the time of the measurement until conjunction. Then, if necessary, divide that number by 24 to see how many days until the conjunction. Example, you have accurately measured that the sun and moon have an angular separation of 25 degrees. Simply divide 25 degrees by 0.5 degrees the number of degrees the sun gains on the moon every hour, which equals 50. This is how many hours until conjunction. See, now you figured out how many hours. But for those of you who don't want to, then you need to know how many days that is. Then we have another little formula. Then if necessary, you can also divide 50 by 24, the number of hours in a day, to see how many days it will be until conjunction. 50 hours plus 24 hours equals 2 uh, point one days away from conjunction. Now, the thing is with this that we want to talk about for a second is um, how do we how do I how do I go into this? Oh, well, this is what we were talking about earlier too with the time, like going off of Jerusalem time. All you have to do then is calculate once you figure out the time for yourself of when it's going to be, then calculate that time, then just um, add or subtract that time from Jerusalem's time, your time zone from Jerusalem's time zone to figure that out so that we can all be on one accord. Because when Christ comes back, uh, all of this will be observed in Jerusalem during this thousand year reign. All right. So we want to be on one accord. All right. And we have to be on one accord globally for the sake of having a calendar. If you're not, then things get things get messy, okay? And God is not the author of confusion. And here's the picture example of, like I was saying, how you would take the measurement. And you can see by using centimeters, if you look, you want to make sure you have it pointed right at the horizon of the sun and in the middle of the crescent moon. But you can see, like, this is how you would go out and do it, you know, if you needed to. Um, I'm all for technology, 
And so we have technology that can calculate this for us. So I just use the technology because God gave us brains for us to use them and man to increase in knowledge. All right, now on to the precepts. Genesis 1.14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Um, and there had already been days before this. Remember, there was already four days before he says, um, before he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. But we've been covering in this whole entire lesson this point that they're up there for us to divide the seasons and the signs. And I've been breaking down to you with math and science, you know, the math being geometry and, uh, you know, math and science, astronomy, like how this is actually done. It's not any like real spookery. That's what we've been covering. Leviticus 23 and 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their feet seasons. The feasts must be proclaimed in their seasons. Exa example, tabernacles is in gathering, um, happens in fall, harvest. Like these things have to happen in certain seasons. OK, and they knew when those seasons were, whether it, whether it be fall and spring, they knew when these seasons were. OK, so that's why you can't have a straight. Let's just count 30 days. You can't do that because you end up with a 360 day calendar. And when you have a 360 day calendar, things get messed up because of the sun cycle being 365 days, which causes there to be things to fall out of season. For example, if you don't make this correction, Passover can end up happening in winter or like fall or like who knows, like things, will, it'll just get, it'll get out of season eventually. Okay. All right. There's no spook, there's no spookery here. Uh, number three, Deuteronomy 16, one, observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. If you see here, observe does not, uh, we're going to go into this. Observe does not necessarily mean look up in the sky. Observe can mean to keep. Observe can mean to just be aware of. It doesn't mean like it has to be, I literally observed it. Because remember, we haven't, we can't read one example in the Bible where it says someone looked up and saw the moon, then let the people know that this was, uh, that this was the, uh, the new moon had come. Okay. We can't read an example of that with the Israelites. But besides that, if you look up the word observe in the Hebrew here that's used, it doesn't always mean to look up. In matter of time, most of the matter of fact, most of the time it don't mean that. Um, but this is at the point where we're about to get into these final precepts and destroy these false doctrines and you know finish them. Whoa! Finish him. Whoa! What? Finish it. What? Finish it. It's weird that you care about this. Brutality. You should go into radio. No, nah, man. I want to be a docent at a museum, a fancy museum. Get real into art. All right. Now we're going to read these in detail. It's going to be a lot like a lot of just just reading it so that we can kill this. <laughs> Observe. Here is the Hebrew word shamar. Um, observe here, and that should be H E R E, um, not H E R. I was in a rush. Um, observe here is the Hebrew word shamar H eight one zero four. The KG the KJV translates Strong's H eight one zero four in the following manner: um, Keep two hundred eighty three times. Observe forty six times. He thirty five times. Keeper. 28 times, preserve 21 times, beware nine times, mark eight times, watchman eight times, wait seven times, watch seven times, regard five times, save two times, miscellaneous nine times. Outline of biblical usage, to keep, guard, observe, give heed to keep, have charge of to keep, guard, keep watch and ward, protect, 
Save life. Watch. Watchman. To watch for. Wait for to watch. Observe to keep. Retain. Treasure up in memory. To keep within bounds. Restrain. Restrain to observe. Celebrate. Keep. Perform. You know, and in there with keep, you know this Sabbath or covenant or commandment. Perform. To keep. Preserve. Protect. To keep. Preserve. To be on one's guard. Take heed. To take care. Take heed. Take care. Beware. Of beware to keep oneself, refrain, as abstain to be kept, be guarded, um, to keep, pay head, to keep oneself. Strong's definition, shamar, a primitive root properly, to hedge about as with thorns. Example, guard, generally to protect, attend, etc. Be ward, be, circum, be circumspect, take heed to self, keeper of self, mark, look narrowly, observe. Preserve, regard, reserve, save, sure, wait, watch. That's why I was saying, though you don't know when it says observe there, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's saying you have to, now right there, they have to look up in the sky and see the sliver. That's observe has many different connotations, okay? Okay, next precept, 1 Samuel 20 and 5. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at evening. David knew in advance the new moon, meaning new month. Okay, and he knew the new moon, meaning new month. All right, like he knew in advance. How did he know in advance? Because they could calculate that, and we've already shown you that with science and math. OK, also like these people will say, oh, well, well, see, see, um, King's King Saul, he, he ate meat multiple days after that. So, see, they they probably had a way where they just guessed that the new moon would be around this time. And then if they saw it, good. But then if they didn't see it, then it would be the next day. And then that will be proclaimed to be the new. You're telling me a whole bunch of stuff, bro, that you can't read to me in the Bible. You're just giving me a whole bunch of speculation. And I don't care about your speculation. All I care about is salvation. And like and with some of these people, like I say, they say you don't I don't have a kingdom to throw you in, a lake of fire or a kingdom to put you in. Exactly right. So everybody gotta work out their own salvation. And when you have these confusion with these calendars, you making people, you know, that's playing around with people's salvation and it's not funny. Like <laughs> real talk, like real deal, like real deal holy field. And we need to be on one accord. Um, anyways, so yeah, you see, and that makes no sense because they can't read it to you anywhere in the Bible. And we've already discussed how logistically that doesn't, that doesn't work with you having to keep stuff because I mean, they even keep in the, in Christ's kingdom, you're going to have to come and make sacrifices on the new moon and people made sacrifices on the new moon in Israel too. And if you made sacrifices, you had to go to where the priests were. How did you know when to get there? Like, how did you get there in time when we were talking about the distances like we were talking about earlier? All right. Now, let's look at Isaiah 47 and 13. So we just got here, David, an example in the Bible where someone is telling you that they knew that the, the new moon was going to come the next day. And all new moon means is first day of the month. That's what people get confused off of. All that. That's all that that means is first day of the month. So he they had already calculated the conjunction. And then they knew, so therefore they knew the next day, like, okay, well, that the conjunction happened today. So I know the next day will be the first day of the month because we're already in a day right now. So we can't automatically, when this happens, we can't just be like, ah, it's, you know, we're changing this from the 29th day or the 30th day to the, to the first day. You're already in a day, so you have to wait till the next day. That becomes the first day. All right. Anyways, Isaiah 47, 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. And this is the prophecy dealing with Babylon and coming against Babylon. But we want to focus here on month, monthly prognosticators. And I already know there are some people who study the Bible, like study stuff diligently. And they'll be like, man, monthly prognosticators here are the people who would announce in ancient Assyria, uh, you know, and in Babylon and the Chaldeans who would announce to them at the beginning of the new moon when they observed it and would tell the king his fortunes or what was going to happen to him in the future. 
Um, okay, but I'm going to go off of what I can read in English, and I'm going to go off of what we can also read in the Hebrew, and it's pretty clear on what it's talking about. And so this would just be an example, too, of showing like people being able to, ancient people in the Bible, ancient people being able to predict the new moon. Um, so one we have here, it is clear ancient Israelites had astronomers. We know that, too. We saw the sundial. This prophecy is dealing with um, Babylon, the Chaldeans, though. Mostly monthly prognosticators predicted new moon in advance using science, which is astronomy, geography, and math. And you see here, even in this verse, other people, there were astrologers. Those are people who do like the horoscope. Stargazers are people who do the astronomy, just like uh, that's an actual science. It's not like ooga booga stuff. And you have monthly prognosticators, people who will tell you when the new moon is coming in. Like I said, I know what some of the Bible commentaries say about monthly prognosticators. I'm going off of what I can read here, like I said, in English, and we're going to go over it in the Hebrew from the Masoretic text, too. And we're going to look at it even in the Vulgate, just to drive the point home. Okay, monthly prognosticator, okay, and all definitions will be from Webster's Dictionary 1828. I like to use older dictionaries because the, you know, the King James was written at an older time. I want English from closer to that time, you know, and this is a little bit still a little bit after when the King James was written, but it's still older American English, pretty similar. All right, and, um, and then, you know, we're using Strong's Hebrew. Monthly. Monthly adjective continue because remember we just read in Isaiah and it said that they have monthly prognosticators. Monthly adjective continued a month or performed in a month as the monthly revolution of the moon. Notice the monthly revolution of the moon. One done or happening once a month or every month as the monthly concert of a prayer, a monthly visit, monthly adverb. And I know this for some of y'all, it might be like, man, this is redundant. But no, man, there's some people out there that are on this sliver observation tip and have gone off on some far tangents. And I just want to be very clear, like all putting a lot of information, even if it is redundant. Monthly, adverb, once a month, in every month. The moon changes monthly. The moon changes monthly. This is from the dictionary. One ad for monthly. As if under the influence of the moon in the manner of a lunatic. Strong's Hebrew H2320. Kodesh. KJV translation count total 276 times. The KJV translates Strong's H2320 in the following manner. Month 254 times. Um, new moon 20 times. Monthly one time. Another one time. Outline of biblical usage. New moon, month, monthly, the first day of the month, th the first day of the month, the lunar month. Strong's definition, Kodesh, from H2318, the new moon, by implication, a month, new moon. So you see there that a month means new moon, or that the first day of the month starts at the new moon, okay? And we've already discussed that when the conjunction happens, right after the conjunction, is when the new moon is visible. Whether you can see it or not, it's visible. So we can calculate the conjunction fairly easy with math and tools that ancient people would have been able to use too. We've seen an example where David clearly said that he knew the new moon, like that the first day of the month, the new moon was happening tomorrow. Whatever day that the conjunction happens in that you can calculate, the first day of the month comes the day after that. Because you're already in a day. So you can't change the day's number midday. So you wait for that day to end at evening, which we can also calculate when there's no darkness by using astronomical twilight at astronomical dusk. And we've covered that in the lesson too. I hope this is making sense. Like, I really hope this is making sense. So month means, it just means, same here in Kodesh and Hebrew, month and new moon means the same thing. It means from one new moon to another new moon. That's what month means, or monthly. All right, let's keep going. 
All right, moving along. And this lesson, too, should, to should tell you and let people know, like, there are scholars on the West Coast, too. There are scholars in the South. There are scholars in a lot of different places in our community for the in the grow this Israelite thing. Not everything has to just be, you know, the focal points tend to be like the New York and the Chicago area and stuff just disseminating from there. Like there's people, there's learned Israelites in a lot of different places. You'd be surprised. All right. Number two, prognosticate. All right. This is from the Daniel Webster Dictionary. Verb, transitive from prognostic. And I put prognosticate because a prognosticator is just somebody who prognosticates. And we read in Isaiah that there were astrologers, stargazers, um, I think the name something else on the previous slide, and they had monthly prognosticators. And so we've already covered that the word there used for monthly prognosticator was new moon or monthly from one new moon to another new moon, right? That equals a month. That was the Hebrew word used. And um, that was also we read it in English from. So we got the Strong's Hebrew and we had the um, Daniel Webster's or Webster's 1828 dictionary. All right. Now, prognosticate verb transitive from prognostic one to foreshadow. That's to predict to indicate a future event by present signs. So when I showed you think about this, like that's why I said you have to go off what you can read. Now, because I know some of them Bible commentaries, like I said, they say, oh, they observe. That's because everybody is going off of this sliver tradition that they get from some historians at the time, like Josephus and others. But they also get it from the Talmud because the Talmud is where they say all of this stuff. And we the Talmud is a satanic book. Don't fool with that. All right. Anyways, um, when I had the slide up earlier where you took the tape measure. And you could put the tape measure in front of you and hold it at the horizon of the sun and stretch it out at the angle and put it in the middle of the crescent. And I gave you the mathematical formula for how you do that, how you, calcu uh, how you calculate the conjunction. Um, that's what this is saying here for prognosticator in the dictionary in English to foreshadow to indicate a future event by present signs. The future event that we're predicting with uh, is the conjunction and the signs that we're and we're using the present signs is the relation of the crescent moon in the center. The angle is sat at the center with the horizon of the sun, which we covered when we in earlier in the lesson when we got the math for that and the formula and how to do all that. Remember, see where all this is going. So I'm showing you a scripture in the Bible where people actually is telling you that they could predict the new moon coming. They already knew how to predict that. OK. And you can predict that by the conjunction. A clear sky at sunset prognosticates a prognosticates a fair day to foretell by me. And that's just once again letting you know it means to predict in advance. This has nothing to do with observation. So a prognosticator predicting in advance, a monthly prognosticator, which in the Hebrew uh, wording would have been a new moon prognosticator. Me is somebody who predicts the new moon or the month, the first day of the month in advance. OK, that's why we have calendars. Two, to foretell by means of present signs to predict. We already discussed that. That's what you do when you do when you got the tape measure and you hold it out. Then you're predicting by present signs. I neither will nor can prognosticate to the young gaping heir his father's fate. OK prognosticator noun a foreknower or foreteller of a future event by present signs i think we've driven this point home strong's hebrew here h3045 that was used for prognostic prognosticator yada kjv translation count total 947 times the kjv translates strong's h3045 in the following manner no 645 times so that means to know okay Known 105 times, um, knowledge 19 times, perceive 18 times, show 17 times, tell 18 times, wish 17 times, understand 17 times, certainly seven times, acknowledge six times, acquaintance six times, consider six times, declare six times. So remember, they said that in the commentaries, it'll be like, well, that they're declaring to the king that they, they observed it and what's going to happen to him in the future. 
this it's only translated as declare six times in the Bible. You, you feel me? Like, so that anyway, I'm just pointing this, these things out. Six times to teach, five times miscellaneous. Uh I mean to teach five times, miscellaneous eighty-five times. Okay? Uh and you see here, like in the manner it's translated, it's to know is 645 times, known 105 times, is to and you then knowledge. The top three times is to have knowledge of something, to know how to do something, bruh. Okay? Just go off what you can read. Um outline of biblical usage. To know. See, to know already. You know you understand what I'm saying? To know already. Learn to know to perceive. These are all not involving observation. Then you get to possibly it's okay. Well, you know, maybe they observed it to perceive and see, find out and discern to discriminate. This is this is all dealing with figuring out something in advance. Distinguish to know by experience to recognize, admit, acknowledge, confess to consider to know, be acquainted with to know. So like consider be acquainted with to know, be acquainted with to know what? To know how to predict when a new moon is coming based off of conjunction. Let me just keep driving this point home. Be revealed to make oneself known, to be perceived, to be instructed, to cause to know, to cause to know, to be known, one known, acquaintance, to make known, declare, to be known, to make oneself known, reveal oneself. So you see here in that verse in Isaiah that a month with the Babylonians, that a monthly prognosticator was someone who let them know in advance when the first day of the month was going to be or when the new moon was going to be. And we've covered and this lesson repeatedly. Now, that how you can do that simply is by using the conjunction. OK, continuing on Strong's definition for prognosticator what was translated as prognosticator. Yada, yada, a primitive root to know properly to ascertain by seeing and we just showed you how you ascertain by seeing that's another thing you are calculating it by making an observation they would have done that in ancient times that's how they would have done it and now you can do things with satellites and different things but other tools now are making observations for you but you are making an observation that's why like oh my goodness man that's why i don't like brothers brothers please stop going off on these tangents man because you're just mucking it up for everybody. Like you're and it's making us look it makes us not look good. It doesn't make us look professional. And going off on tangents when you don't have backgrounds and certain stuff and yeah, you know, you may know be knowledgeable in some things, but that don't make you knowledgeable in everything. Man, anyways, so just think about that too. Even when you're calculating the conjunction, you do calculate the conjunction by using observation. We just showed that in one way that you would have, that you would observe to predict it. You have to observe certain things in the sky to predict the conjunction. And you can predict that in advance. That right there should be the other finishing fatality. Toasty. Yeah, I do voices. Anyway, because <laughs> I watch a lot of cartoons. That's what keeps me sane when I'm not doing Jesus stuff. <laughs> Our, our history stuff is cartoons. My wife will tell you. I watch cartoons and sports. That's pretty much what I watch. Um, all right. <laughs> like, I hopefully, like, this has really been put to bed now. Like, this is really over. Using a great variety of senses. You know what? I'm not going to even read the rest of the thing. We're going to move into the next slide. Like, <laughs> you can look at the slide and read the rest of the stuff and see. But we're driving the point. Driving the point home, like that this should be this should be done. We all should be on one calendar that is not that difficult to come up with. Okay? Like alrighty. Alright, last points. We have seen the KJV and Masoretic text. Let's look at the Vulgate, which is the Latin translation done by Jerome. In the early church period, which I'm not advocating to use, I'm just pointing out what what it says in here too. To drive the point home with the monthly prognosticator. And I just translated it from Google. All right. I, um, I'm not going to read the Latin, but translate it from Google. Translate Isaiah 47, 13. We have 
have failed in many councils. Now the astrologers stand and save thee, meaning let them help, help thee. They that gaze at the stars, those teaching concerning the months, like so from those things that come on thee. Anyways, but you see here, even in the Vulgate, it was translated, those teaching concerning the months, teaching them, telling the people when the months were going to start because they had a calendar. You can't have a calendar. That's another thing. You can't have ancient calendars unless they were able to predict certain things in advance. Bruh. Now, Deut Deuteronomy 32 and 21, because I want to drive another point home before we close. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. Okay, at the time of the at the time Moses is writing this, and this is getting into some history stuff, the Gentiles were doing like um more than more or less like barbarous things. They weren't on a their level of civilization was not as high as Shem and Ham's people at that time okay this has nothing to do with degenerate uh degenerating any people because now we live in the time of the gentiles and as you saw with the persians and the uh the greeks and the romans and europe today they've advanced to a point and, it, and in my opinion with technology more advanced than we've ever had on planet earth so things just move in cycles but at that time the gentiles were not a relevant factor okay and he's and uh moses is letting the israelites know that you will be provoked to jealousy by a foolish nation. And remember, it also says in the Bible that his name will become great among the Gentiles, right? Now let's go out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we got Old Testament, we got Moses. Now let's get some more clarification from Paul. And I'm going somewhere with this because some of the stuff that brothers be always thinking stuff is a conspiracy, like, oh man, they done changed this and they changed the letter to that. And this King James this. Or right, and then, you know, we just read in English and blah, 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 dude. And uh, how do you know the Bible was given, the, the King James Bible was given to us because God wanted us to have the King James Bible. That's simply, simply put, because he's going to have the, the Bible put in whatever language, wherever we were going to be dispersed at in captivity. It says he will speak to us with a stammering lips and tongues in that, and uh, Jeremiah, that he's going to speak with his people, meaning other languages, okay? Because we were going to be dispersed many different places. So these, some of these things are to provoke you to jealousy. When you're looking at, man, these Gentiles, they're the ones making the Bibles and giving them, and we learn, and we getting it from them and all of that. But this is, a, this is our book. This is about us. Well, we ain't making the book and producing this stuff because we in the curses. And most of us don't even know our own identity and heritage. And then when you find out, now you're getting provoked to jealousy. And the provoking you to jealousy is really to just get you on your job which is to be a nation of priests, to bring the other sons of Adam back into reconciliation with Christ, okay? That was just learning something on your way to learning something. Like, what does it mean when it's like, oh, to provoke you to jealousy? Romans 10, 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Romans eleven eleven. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come on to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. All right. I hope you learned something and was blessed. I'm going to have a calendar up on the next slide that just kind of give you further understanding on how the days work in the Hebrew calendar. I'll leave that up for 20 seconds for observation. Um, I hope you were blessed. Shalom.